Good morning and welcome to the 36th annual Norris and Marjorie Benditson Epic International Symposium, China and the World. My name is Daniel Di Giovanni. I'm a current fourth year at Tufts studying economics and international relations. Thank you for joining us for our first panel on China, US, Russia, multipolarity or polar opposites. On behalf of the Institute for Global Leadership, I would like to welcome the delegations of students from Argentina, Brazil, Canada, China, Ireland, Israel, Kenya, Russia, and Singapore, as well as from the US Air Force Naval and Military Academies. As sano US relations continue to progress, a debate has unfolded as to whether the two major powers are edging closer towards a new Cold War. However, this increasingly adversarial relationship between Washington and Beijing will likely manifest itself within a multipolar order with Russia occupying the third pole. Unlike the perspective formation of dual superpower blocks, a tripolar arrangement between the US, China, and Russia promises to be highly variable. As international relations scholar Kenneth Waltz once asserted, tripolarity is often characterized by profound instability and rapid aggressions to bipolarity, as any two nation coalition will naturally isolate the third pole. Recent headlines about Russian Chinese cooperation on a lunar station may demonstrate that. Over the last three decades, Beijing and Moscow have converged within the realms of security and economy, a non-confrontational and mutually beneficial relationship buttressed by shared opposition to the United States. In many regards, this considerable Sino-Russian rapport manifested in a lucrative energy trade, security collaboration, and harmonious regional policies in the Middle East, Central Asia, and Korean Peninsula has defied the expectations of many. However, it is abundantly unclear how long this rapprochement will last. China has been regarded by some as a system player, vested in an international order that Russia may not be, posing a challenge for their relationship. The following expert panel will examine the short and long-term outlook for collaboration and conflict, the potential for instability within a US-China-Russia tripolar arrangement, and the predominant geopolitical and regional policy ramifications of this evolving dynamic. Before I introduce our panelists, I would like to explain how the panel will run. For the purposes of encouraging as much discussion as possible, each panelist has been asked to give opening remarks of five minutes. We will then open the panel to discussion amongst our speakers and subsequently open the panel to, to the audience for questions and answers. First, I would like to introduce Minister Councillor Piao Yang Fan, the Chief of the Political Section of the People's Republic of China Embassy in the United States. Welcome, Minister Councillor. Hi. You have the floor. Okay. Hi, it's a pleasure to take part in this webinar and thank you for the invitation. I'd like to make following points. Number one, the development of China attracts attention of the world. I'd like to point out that the fundamental purpose of the China's development is to enable the Chinese people to lead a better life. Our country is still a developing one and there is a long way to go before we can achieve modernization. China goes along the path of peaceful development, which is written in the constitution. We hope that other countries will choose the same path as well. Number two, the development of China provides enormous opportunities for other countries. For instance, in the past seven years, since we launched the Belt and the Road Initiative, China's trade in good, goods with partner countries surpassed $7.8 trillion and the direct investment in those countries topped $110 billion. All this has been helpful for local employment and economic growth. Number three, China harbors no intention to threaten or challenge somebody else, but has legitimate rights to safeguard its interests. Some people perceive the development of China as threat or challenge. I think it's a re result of zero sum game thinking. All the countries can and should live in peace together, evolve together and lift up each other. For one to succeed, it's not necessary to hope others to fail. Playing great powers competition and rivalry is an outdated mindset. 
the world is facing multiple global challenges and threats, such as climate change, infectious diseases, and terrorism, so on and so forth. All the countries are in the same boat and should make every effort to build up a community of shared future for the mankind. Cooperation is the only right choice. Number four, China, the US, and Russia as major countries of the world and the permanent members of the UN Security Council show their special responsibility. It would be a good news for the world if the three countries could respect each other, treat each other on the basis of equality and non-interference in internal affairs. Diversity is the integral feature of human civilization and differences in system should not be the ground for antagonism or confrontation. Democracy is a common value of humanity, but there is no fixed model. True democracy must be rooted in the realities of a country and endorsed by its people. Smear and slander a different system, or even for the sake of realization of one's geopolitical interests, is acceptable. Number five, China and the US both stand to gain from cooperation and lose from confrontation. Naturally, the two countries would have differences. It's important that we manage them effectively through candid communications to avoid strategic misjudgments, conflict, and confrontation. As two biggest economies, it's normal that China and the US compete sometimes while their interests converge with each other. What matters most is to conduct benign competition on the basis of justice and fairness, but not attack each other or play zero-sum game. In 2020, despite the pandemic, the trade in goods between China and the US achieved over 580 billion US dollars, growing by 8%. The report of the US-China Business Council shows that 91% surveyed American enterprises said that their operations on the Chinese market in 2020 were profitable, and 87% enterprises said that they will not leave China. In one word, decoupling between China and the US is impossible. Number six, China and Russia share the borderline of more than 4,300 kilometers. The two sides have enjoyed close historical and cultural ties, economic complementarity, high level of political and strategic trust, the two countries take similar or identical approaches to the major international and hot sports issues. Cooperation in various areas between the two countries have been broadened, enhanced, and deepened over the past years. China and Russia characterize their relations as comprehensive strategic partnership of coordination, which set an example for the new type of relations between major countries and play a constructive role for the world peace and common development. China-Russia relations are not allied and not directed against a third party. In the international relations, we should abide by the principle of openness and inclusiveness instead of closeness and exclusiveness. To foster small circles against some specific countries is group politics. Cooperation between relevant countries should not damage the interests of a third party. Number seven, there are still many countries of middle or small size in the world. All the countries enjoy sovereign equality. Their interests and pursuits should be truly taken into account. And the principle of multilateralism and the equal footed consultations should be observed in order to advance democratization of the international relations and build up a multipolar world. No country possesses monopoly on the international affairs. Major powers should not seek hegemony. Number eight, 
the last but not the least, I'd like to say that the friendship between ordinary people is the source of the relationship between countries. The future of the world is in the hands of the young generation. This event with the participation of the students from many countries is quite meaningful. Hopefully, the young people of all countries will enhance mutual understanding and foster true, objective, and fair knowledge about each other. It will lay the foundation for the sustainable peace and the development of the world. Thank you. Thank you for your very engaging open, opening remarks, Minister Councillor Piao. Next up is Dr. Alexander Gabuev, a senior fellow and the chair of Russia in the Asia Pacific program at the Carnegie Moscow Center of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Dr. Gabuev, you have the floor. Thank you, Daniel, and a pleasure to be here. I'll try to be very brief and pointed in order to leave more room for the discussion. First, I would disagree with the notion of a trilateral international order because I don't think that Russia really belongs in the category of superpowers anymore. Uh, I think that Russia used to be size of Guangdong economy a couple of years back. Now it's probably size of Shandong economy. It's smaller than Texas. And yes, the great power metrics is not about the only about GDP size, but the comprehensive national power of Russia is a far cry from either the US or China. What Russia really is, is a strong great power that is fully strategically autonomous so far. And there are very few countries in that league. And Russia actually takes pride of maintaining a full strategic autonomy. If you count, you can find perhaps India being in the same league. And then we have troubles because many of the great power, economic powerhouses, technologically powerhouses or military advanced countries are allies of the United States. So their sovereignty is limited by their alliance obligations. And many countries that are fully sovereign uh, like North Korea or Iran are definitely important regional players, but don't necessarily have the global reach. So Russia is unique, but it's not a pole uh, in the international system. Uh, Russia's key task for the upcoming decades is really to balance its relationship uh, with the, the United States and China and not to be dragged into the confrontation between the two superpowers. That's the way the Russian leadership uh, defines the national strategic goals. So Russia actually doesn't want to pick sides uh, in this confrontation or very enhanced and a pretty bitter competition. Uh, Russia's problem is that the relationship with both sides are now increasingly different and changing. With the U.S., uh, it's going to get worse before it gets worse. I think that many people paid attention to uh, yesterday's spat between President Putin and President Biden following uh, Biden's interview to ABC channel. Uh, it's a scandal, but it's just a symptom of a far bigger problem that the U.S.-Russia uh, relationship is now which is uh, in free fall, there are very few low hanging fruits of positive cooperation and most of them have been already picked in the first days of the administration. I'm speaking about the renewal of the START Treaty. There might be limited cooperation on issues of climate change and the environment. There might be cooperation on the Iran nuclear uh, dossier and North Korea, but beyond that, everything else is more about competition or managing this competition that it doesn't turn into a hot standoff. So prevention of uh, unintended incidents on air, sea and land is probably the most important task. With China, the relationship is deepening and I would agree with Minister Council that uh, even if we take away the US from the picture, we see a very important improvement in this relationship over the course of the last uh, couple of years. Um, I think that it's not only because of Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping have an amicable relationship, but the drivers are really structural. One of them is the border. Uh, Russia and China decided to sort out their territorial uh, issues back in late 80s when pragmatism prevailed in both uh, capitals with Deng Xiaoping at the helm of the uh, Communist Party in China and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev at the helm of the Soviet Union. So the course to gradually resolve the territorial dispute was inherited by Mr. Putin from his two predecessors. Uh, and now this border is a factor of stability because Russia and China understand 
the downsides, the risks, and the costs of having adversarial relationship along this monumental border. So not always with each other, but never against each other is the formula that drives this relationship. Then there is the huge economic complementarity between the two that is largely untapped and that both countries are continue to tap with uh, a deal signed in 2014 on the gas pipeline. The two sides are discussing a new pipeline deal. There is flow of LNG coming to Russia, bulk of agricultural products, fertilizers. So they are a perfect match when China has a huge capital surplus, has a giant market and has really cutting edge technology and Russia needs modern technology or requires foreign direct investment and also has abundance of natural resources. And the third uh, pillar is similarities between the political regime because Russia claims to be democracy. China is also a democracy with Chinese characteristics, but neither is a democracy in best in sense. So uh, I think that sovereignty and non-interference into affairs of other powers which means that the US and the West shouldn't interfere into affairs of Russia and China is really a unifying moment in domestic political setup. Uh, China couldn't care less about Russia's minority rights or uh, prosecution of gay people in Chechnya or whatever. Russia couldn't care less about situation in Xinjiang or Hong Kong because it's really a bilateral issue from the kind of national standpoint. So these three pillars are really uh, driving them closer together Russia's problem is that in the current standoff between the two poles, it has to put more eggs in the basket China. And as the confrontation develops, Russia reduces its dependency on the, on the West, including in terms of trade, uh, finance to an extent, and particularly modern technology, and uh, throws its slot with China. So it's increasingly dependent on China in modern technology. And it doesn't adapt that technology fully, but it definitely uh, imports more so when we are talking about strategic civilian technologies like uh, 5G and others, China is increasingly a prominent player. So down the road, the key challenge for Russia will be how to address this growing asymmetry between China and Russia because uh, the Chinese economy continues to grow. Russia is a prolonged recession due to lack of structural reform. So far, China treats Russia with a lot of respect, a lot of caution, uh, but there is no guarantee that this will continue that way forever. And uh, since China will have the stronger cards and stronger leverage one or two decades down the road, it might be tempted to use it in order to forge a far better uh, conditions or uh, far, be far, far better ends of the deal uh, that it has now. And uh, for Russia, balancing that is a key challenge given the reality that the relationship with the U.S. is deeply broken and doesn't have a quick fixes uh, in short term. I'll stop here. Thank you for those remarks, Dr. Gabalev. Next is Dr. Richard Weiss, a senior fellow, fellow and director of the Center for Political Military Analysis at the Hudson Institute. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I agree that the, the China-Russia relationship is probably stronger than at any previous point in history. Uh, you see an unprecedented range of joint security, economic and diplomatic initiatives. Um, as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, they've resolved their territorial disputes and you see a lot of cooperation in both bilaterally and multilaterally in the UN and their leaders seem to get along very well. They meet very frequently, much more frequently than Russian and Chinese leaders in the past. And what's interesting is you've also seen the, the diplomats from both countries uh, discuss not only what they oppose in terms of the US policies, principles, and, and institutions, but also talk, offer their own joint visions of various uh, issues. So in the opposition category, you see them denounce US military alliances, missile defenses, uh, arms control policies and so on. And then in their cooperation is visible, for example, in, in Central Asia and, and Korean Peninsula and, and integrating their econ Eurasian economic integration projects. Um, and at the global level, you see them pushing joint norms for cyber and outer space, for international economics and, and other uh, areas of, of, of the world governance. 
But as I think it's important to note that this Sino-Russian cooperation very substantially by time, by region, and by functional area. So time, it's clearly on the upswing now, but before, um, both in Soviet and Russian history, it, we've seen substantially worse relationships. Um, in terms of, of region, uh, you see them uh, sometimes very working very closely, but other times not at all. You don't see much coordination at all. So you see most cooperation in Central Asia and increasingly in East Asia, and now even the Arctic, but you don't see much alignment in Europe, in South Asia, or the Middle East, and probably hardly any in Latin America or Africa. In functional areas, there's strong cooperation and security in terms of arms sales, in terms of joint exercises, joint statements. Um, but in the economic domain, uh, as Alex mentioned, it's really lagging behind a lot of expectations. Even in energy, we almost see a natural partnership given Russia's resources and China's needs, it's been taking them, it took them years to begin the flow of large, uh, large flow of energy resources from Russia to China. Um, and I think that this, uh, it, even in the defense, it's clear it's not a mutual defense alliance. It's not as close as the US ties, for example, with NATO or South Korea or Japan. Um, and you see, it's this, uh, the phrase that often been offered is that of alignment without alliance and in which they can, as Alex mentioned, they can do uh, what they want with regard to third parties as long as they don't really conflict each other. So it's not as if they demand that you're with us or against us. It's more, you know, Russia can do what it wants in Ukraine and Georgia and China can do what it wants in the East China Sea and against Taiwan and the others won't, uh, won't necessarily need to overtly support that. And I think that actually makes the, the alignment stronger because it's because it doesn't have many constraints. It doesn't have, require exclusivity or binding agreements. Um, there's not a lot of burden with this. But looking ahead, you know, I think you could see this pattern continue. Uh, and uh, in which, but you could see think, think, things that could drive them apart. Um, it's or closer together. So in the, form, in the latter category, if, if the U.S. were to present a, a more serious, more direct U.S. military threat, you could see them um, deepen their cooperation in terms of exercises, perhaps develop uh, joint missile defenses and so on. In terms of economics, I think the fear in Washington has always been you'll see a marrying up of Russian skills in basic science and technology with China's enorm enormous monetary labor and manufacturing resources. But you could also see, consider many factors why they might split apart. You know, in as I said, in terms of their history, we're sort of in an atypical moment when their, their relationships are good, but you see a lot of past instances when it's much bad. Uh, I, the, the Russians used to tell me when I went there a decade ago, some expressed some concerns about China's military buildup. They refuse to talk about that issue now uh, with, with most Westerners, but I'm sure it's still on their mind. Um, so far, China has been deferential for Russia's security interests in Central Asia, but let's just say things in Afghanistan go much worse and the Chinese don't have confidence that the Russians will defend their interests there, then you could see them adopting more assertive policy in the region, which could alarm Russia. Uh, you certainly see there's still lingering concerns about the demographic disparity in, 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 the, in the Russian Far East and neighboring Chinese provinces and what that means for long-term, Moscow's long-term control of the area. Uh, you see status uh, disruption, I mean, it's probably great some Russians that they're no longer uh, considered by many as the equal superpower uh, of the United States, that it's now China that's considered the, that, that taking that category. Um, and you, the final factor I would like to emphasize is this relationship is really much a top-down driven project. So it's really been driven by the leaders, particularly President Putin on the Russian side, um, but societal level, you still see a lot of Chinese and Russians more interested in learning European languages or studying the U.S. than they do in each other. And so 
that leads me to think that if there's a, a change in leadership in China and especially Russia, you could eventually see a different policy less aligned towards each other. But thank you, and I'm happy to discuss these issues further in discussion and question and, and answer session. Thank you for your remarks, Dr. Weitz. Our fourth speaker is Dr. Ron Emitter. Thank you for joining us. Professor of the History and Politics of Modern China at St. Cross College at Oxford University, whose recent book, China's Good War, contests that China's reassessment of the World War II years is central to its newfound confidence abroad and to mounting nationalism at home. Welcome, Dr. Mitter, you have the floor. Thanks very much indeed, Daniel. And apologies to all who are on this call. I've only just managed to come in because I've been on the back of another talk elsewhere. So I haven't heard the other distinguished panelists' comments. And what I'll do is just spend five minutes or so touching on two points, which I hope haven't been made elsewhere. If they are, I apologize for repeating, but we'll move to panel discussion very soon anyway. Um, so the first one is uh, a more historical point, And the second point is one that is to do with something that is out of this week's headlines. So I hope between the two, we cover a variety of bases on this question of the China Russia, US triangular relationship, if you want to put it that uh, that way. So in historical terms, uh, I mean, as Daniel was kind enough to say, I have spent a lot of my um, you know, academic life in the last few years looking at the way in which one particular historical event, the Second World War, an event which, of course, in a broad sense is known to, you know, I'm sure everyone on, on this call, um, has actually remained a very potent source of political capital both in terms of domestic politics and in terms of international uh, relations for the countries that we are talking about here. And here I'm concentrating mostly on actually China and Russia, although the United States, of course, is relevant to that. But since I think I may be, uh, yes, I think I'm one of the speakers who's not actually in the US at the moment, I will bow to those who are on the, on the American front. I think it's no great secret to those who know Russia well that it has over the years made a great deal of domestic political capital in terms of the great patriotic war and the memory of World War II. But I think it's often less appreciated and uh, in recent years very become very noticeable that actually memorialization of the Russian World War II experience, and I use the word Russian there advisedly because the Soviet experience, while of course embedded within that, also has particular points of difference in parts of the former Soviet Union, such as Central Asia, the Baltics and, and so forth. But the Russian war experience as expressed by the Putin government is now given almost a sort of sacred status in terms of the way in which Russia presents itself both at home and to the outside world. And the element I want to add to that, and which um, I've talked about at more length in the, the book that Daniel kindly mentioned, China's Good War, is that idea that actually China also, not just for the last few years, but really for the last 40 years since the reform era, has also been embedding aspects of that World War II experience into the way that it deals with the wider world in terms of both domestic and international um, experience. So just to, again, in, in a short time, give a couple of quick you know, examples of, of what I mean by, by that. It's worth remembering that, you know, as with the Soviet Union, the Chinese price paid during World War II was immensely high with over 10 million deaths, many tens of millions of refugees, um, and the destruction of much of China's infrastructure during that time. For a long time, China's World War II experience between 1937 and 45 was politically very problematic in China because as most you know, historians will know, including historians in China, the anti-communist Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party of China under Jiang Jishu, Chiang Kai-shek, was of course very central, along with the Chinese Communist Party, of course, in fighting against the Japanese. And in recent years, China's hist uh, history establishment has been much more open about talking about the fact that the non-communists were also uh, immensely uh, closely uh, uh, involved. But that acknowledgement of a wider contribution of defeating the Japanese has opened up certain geopolitical possibilities. So. As I say, one example of that, I'll just stick to one in limited time, 2013, just seven or eight years ago, huge commemoration in China itself, lots of discussion in media about the 70th anniversary of the Cairo Conference of 1943. Slightly obscure seeming World War II conference, who the heck cares about that? Well, actually, one of the arguments made at that time in China, and still very much made today, is that the communique signed by President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and China, meaning of course, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, not Mao Zedong, at the end of the Cairo conference, actually gives authorization to certain 
contemporary maritime claims in the East China Sea in particular, the Yu Senkaku Islands uh, dispute comes up in that context uh, very, very, uh, very frequently. And so that kind of present day uh, territorial claim can be backed up by a selective, but actually quite informed use of China's World War II experience. And that's also used to bolster the um, relationship with Russia today. So for instance, the fact that in the early days of the war, the Soviet Union was actually very supportive of the Chinese war effort, sending I think over 150 Soviet fighter pilots unofficially to help the nationalist army. And also of course, um, providing a lot of uh, military and financial assistance. All of this of course was assisting the nationalist government of China, the Chiang Kai-shek government, not primarily the communists, but nonetheless is regarded as part of this wider sense of Russia and China having that shared relationship. Let me add one further note aside from this historical one, but as I said, I do want to put on the table the idea that history, modern history in, in general, and World War II history in particular, is a really important point of connection and contrast and connection between Russia and China today. The other element I want to bring up from today's, or this week's headlines, is an event that you may not have noticed because it happened here in the UK, uh, where I am now, rather than in the US, which was the big British document, 114 pages long, about the strategic integrated review of foreign policy and, uh, uh, and uh, defence policy. Uh, you can find it for free on the British government's uh, website if you want to see it, and obviously in short term, I can't talk, nor will I talk about all of its many complex aspects. But I do want to talk about the different ways in which the British government today has positioned Russia and China in you know, the year 2021, because it says something very interesting about geopolitics in the near future. The United Kingdom has positioned Russia as a hostile power. You may say that's wrong, you may say that's right, I'm not making a judgment here, I'm just saying that word hostile has been used in black and white in the document. China is being phrased in a way that is much more nuanced, to use a word. It's being talked about as a competitor, as a co collaborator in areas like climate change, and also potentially an opponent. So that echoes the words of Tony Blinken, of course, in the rather robust meeting that we've been talking about now down in Anchorage in the last few days about, you know, uh, cooperating where we can, opposing where, where we must. In other words, the UK orienting itself towards, perhaps in both cases, a view of China and Russia that will find favor with the Biden administration in a way that actually I think probably wouldn't have worked in quite the same way with the former Trump administration. So my final thought there is look at the UK as a mid-sized but significant geopolitical actor with obviously a P5 UN Security Council seat, significant if small armed forces and a global trading role. And look at the way in which China and Russia are positioned differently to understand how the big relationship between the US and these two powers is also refracted through middle powers as well, because of course, those three big actors are huge, but they're not the only ones in that triangular relationship. Okay, Daniel, I'll stop my comments there and hand back to you for the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, Dr. Mader, and thank you again to all of our panelists for those stimulating opening remarks. Panelists, if you have any questions, I invite you to ask and discuss them amongst yourselves. May I respond to some points that were made by other panelists? You have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I uh, very uh, carefully uh, listened to the uh, comments uh, and remarks uh, of the other panelists. I want to respond to some points. Uh, first uh, of all, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Uh, Gabuyev, uh, you should not underestimate uh, the power and the strength of the uh, Russian Federation. We always think that uh, this country is a country with very uh, huge potential for development. Uh, it has uh, a very uh, rich uh, uh, natural resources, uh, very uh, huge uh, scientific and technology potential, uh, potential of human resources. So uh, personally, I uh, very, I'm very optimistic uh, towards uh, the future of Russia. Uh, I'm a Russian speaker. Uh, I worked in Russia 
for uh, quite a few years, uh, uh, six years, uh, I studied over there. So um, I think uh, we should have some confidence in the future uh, of that country uh, that uh, um, lives next, next uh, uh, that is a neighboring country of China. Uh, the second point uh, is that um, I'd like to add information uh, just uh, uh, this year uh, will mark the 20th anniversary of signing uh, the China-Russia uh, uh, Treaty on uh, uh, Good Neighborliness and uh, Friendship, uh, 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 Friendly Cooperation. And the, the two sides uh, already agreed to add some no, new dimensions uh, into uh, the uh, treaty and uh, uh, renew it. Uh, uh, as far as I uh, remember, uh, there is an article in this uh, treaty uh, that China and Russia uh, will, um, will never be enemy uh, towards each other, and they will establish everlasting uh, friendship. And China uh, and Russia have no uh, territorial demands uh, towards each other. Uh, so uh, I think uh, there are very... Um, quite many uh, very positive articles uh, in this uh, treaty. Uh, so, uh, 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 of course, uh, the two countries as two major powers uh, is their consistent, uh, uh, constant task uh, to uh, deepen and enhance strategic and political uh, trust. Uh, but uh, I think the future uh, of the uh, two countries' relationship uh, is a bright one. Um, and uh, uh, as for the uh, points of uh, Mr. Uh, Reitz, uh, you uh, said that China and uh, Russia uh, are not uh, allies. Uh, it's some weak point for, uh, for the relations. I don't think so. Uh, it's true that China and Russia are not uh, allies. They are only partners. But the partnership is more uh, flexible uh, than uh, alliance. Uh, it allows the two countries uh, to maintain their uh, own uh, positions uh, when cooperate in the spheres where their uh, interests uh, are aligning uh, with each other, are converging. Uh, so uh, I think it's not a weak point. It's a strength uh, for the uh, relations between uh, China uh, and uh, uh, Russia. Uh, as for the points that uh, were uh, made by the third interlocutor. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I forgot <laughs> your name, I'm sorry. Uh, you mentioned history. Uh, it's true that uh, history uh, for our countries is a source uh, for absorbing strength and uh, pride. Uh, just uh, last year, uh, all the world celebrated uh, the victory uh, of uh, the world uh, against uh, uh, militarism and uh, fascism, uh, especially uh, China uh, celebrated uh, the uh, victory uh, against uh, Japanese militarists. Um, I think uh, the current international order uh, was established as a result of the victory uh, of the uh, anti-fascist forces uh, of the world. Uh, we should uphold this uh, order this international system with the, uh, with the UN uh, as at, uh, at its core, and uh, uh, which was based on the international law. Uh, so I think uh, the main connecting, one of the main connecting uh, uh, points between China and, the, the, uh, and Russia uh, is that uh, both China and uh, Russia uh, call for um, maintaining safeguarding uh, this uh, international order, but not uh, that so-called rules-based order that was championed only by a few countries. Uh, so uh, in this sense, uh, we are not so-called revisionists. Uh, we uh, call for uh, safeguarding uh, the current international order, uh, although uh, it needs some uh, improvements uh, according to the current changes in the international situation and the international landscape. Thank you.
Do any of our panelists have a response or perhaps another question? Yeah, I just, uh, I just want to say, I, I want to make clear that I agree that the fact that Russia and China are um, not formal allies uh, in the sense, well, I, I just want to remember I said, I said the durability of their strategic partnership is enhanced by this lack of constraints, exclusivity, or binding agreement. So it actually is, makes it harder for, to break this alignment because the Russians don't demand that China fully and openly support what they do in Ukraine um, and Georgia. And the Chinese have not fully demanded um, that Russia, for example, back their territorial stances in the East China Sea or against Japan. Um, but I think as Alex mentioned, uh, this may not always be the case. At some point, the Chinese may decide that since they have certain, you know, the, 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 China, the Russians have become dependent on them for economic and other reasons, they may actually demand that, for example, Russia stop selling such advanced weapons to India or more openly support their stance against uh, Japan. Two fingers on this. Uh, first, Minister Council Piao, thank you so much for expressing uh, confidence in the future of my country. Uh, as you've spent time in Russia, you know that this is a sport of uh, Russian intelligentsia to be frustrated about lack of progress the way we want uh, our country to succeed and uh, kind of be angry at the government and the society, including ourselves, uh, not delivering enough. Uh, and that's an old tradition going back uh, centuries. Uh, I think that uh, I agree with Richard that uh, there might be some friction points. Uh, and it's normal that China has a lot of leverage and at some point probably wants to use that. Again, this is a hypothesis that's never been tested in linkage of the issues. We've seen that uh, use of leverage in commercial deals, for example, uh, the Russia-China oil pipeline deal in 2011, where China had a lot of leverage by providing the loan and having the market, and it has pressed Rosneft to change uh, the contract a little bit to China's advantage. Similarly, uh, it has also forced Rosneft to abandon its drilling project in Vietnam's uh, territorial waters, that China claims are Chinese territorial waters. So since partnership with China is far more important for Rosneft than partnership with Vietnam, uh, Rosneft was forced to pick size and basically picked China. So these are commercial issues. The big question mark is whether 10 years down the road, Russia's dependency on China will be so huge that China could link the commercial issues and political issues the way we see China doing with Australia. Of course, it's not China's invention, US is doing that time and time and time again. And Russia does the same, of course. Uh, Russia is angry about the quality of Georgian wine once it has uh, political problems with Georgia, same with Moldovan wine, same with many other countries. But that's the big question mark going forward. Uh, and I think that this is a concern in Moscow. How do we diversify our ties enough or how do we build enough other options uh, and maintain, of course, this very productive and respectful relationship with China. Uh, two, two fingers on Richard's remark on the Far East. I don't think that this is a genuine concern anymore uh, in the Russian leadership because of demographic trends in China. Chinese population is aging. Uh, the working age population is aging. So I don't think that anybody seriously believes that this demographic overhang that used to be a big concern in the 90s and a decade ago uh, is a challenge uh, like in the, in the next uh, decades. And I think a good testament to that is uh, the buildup of the cross-border infrastructure on land. Because 10 years ago, China always said, why don't we build a bridge across the Moor River? And Russia always said, it's a great idea. I never did anything because there were concerns by the Russian military that, okay, Today, it's Russian commercial cargo, but tomorrow it might be Chinese tanks rolling over to kind of conquer the Far East. I think that uh, this concern is gone. Uh, and for, for right way, I don't think that this scenario of kind of uh, any demographic challenge to the Russian Far East uh, is, is, is a reality. Uh, the challenge is that China will become the towering economic player in the Far East, but so far the Far East is not too attractive 
uh, for too many investors and uh, also the Chinese presence there is limited. And we can, we can probably talk uh, about Central Asia later. I believe Dr. Mitter has a response and then I would like to open the floor to questions from the audience. So please submit uh, your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Mitter, you have the floor. Sure, yeah, just a brief response. I mean, again, thank you to all panelists for their comments and thank you to Minister Councillor Piao. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think last year's 75th anniversary of the Allied victory was you know, an immensely important event. It was rather spoiled by the pandemics like so many things. So I think the possibility of international co-celebration was pretty limited, but there was still quite a lot that went on. Uh, we know in Beijing, also Moscow and Britain, but, and of course the, the US. But I think um, what I found most interesting is the way that recently a lot of Chinese leaders have been talking about what happened at the end of that event in terms of geopolitics as a starting point for China's role in the world. So I'm thinking, for instance, last year at the Munich Security Conference, China's foreign minister, Mr. Wang Yi, talked about how 1945 was when China was the first signatory to the United Nations Charter. And actually, Xi Jinping, amongst others, has, has talked about this. Now, this marks a really significant shift because, of course, there's still a huge amount of concentration. Of course, in some ways, it was um, seen uh, two years ago in 2019 on the anniversaries to do with uh, Jian Guo, you know, the foundation of the People's Republic of China. And that 1949 date, of course, remains an absolutely foundational one in terms of the country's narrative about itself. But it's only quite recently, within the last mm, five years, 10 years, something like that, that a really big deal has been made of 1945 and that point of origin of the international system with China as a co-owner. So it, I sometimes like to say that Dean Acheson, the US Secretary of State at the time, called his memoirs present at the creation. In other words, the creation of the 1945 world. And these days, China is also saying, well, we were creating it too. We are also there at the beginning of that process of doing it. What I find interesting in the Russian context is that, and I'm not a Russia specialist, so be happy to hear from, from others on this, is that that sense of ownership of the 1945 world is much less clearly expressed. It does seem to me that most of the Chinese, sorry, the Russian discourse around that order, even though of course the Soviet Union, the predecessor state was absolutely a founder of that 1945 order, is much less keen to take ownership of it as a product of the Second World War experience. While China, having previously not really talked about it that much in recent years has very firmly claimed ownership of the 1945 order in a way that's seen in the statements of President Xi Jinping, Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and all sorts of other less famous people who actually make uh, quite similar sorts of points in, in Beijing. So I see a divergence there between the relationship of Russia and China and the historical legacy of the 1945 order in the, in the present day. Okay, I would like to open the floor to our audience. Um, our first question is from Daniel Mandel and it is as follows. Does Russia consider itself to be an Atlantic European nation or an Asian Pacific nation? And how might this impact Russia's actions with respect to increasing US-China tension in the Indo-Pacific region? Is Russia likely to join China to limit US influence in the Pacific or use the shift in Washington's attention from Europe to the Pacific to become more aggressive in Europe? Let me start probably. I don't think that Russia perceives itself as Asian, for sure, and the national polling done by Levada shows that uh, they can hardly find anybody who has an Asian identity beyond probably ethnic minorities who preach Buddhism and are more connected to Buddhist culture of Asia than of uh, mainstream secular Orthodox uh, culture of Russia. But it's interesting that the number of people who identify themselves as Europeans, so say that Russia culturally belongs to Europe has dropped down very significantly over the course of the last decade. And that's probably a result of the government's propaganda, which preaches that uh, Europe has um, abandoned its core traditional values. And Russia is now the beacon of the real traditional core values of the West and is a, a civilization in itself. So I think that Russians are increasingly uh, turning to themselves and seeing themselves as a unique civilization with huge cultural impact of Europe, but very distinct and very different from Europe. On the second part of your question, I don't believe that this will be driven by identity issues, 
but this will be more driven by the strategic pragmatism. Uh, Russia doesn't have too many uh, military assets uh, in the in the Pacific. I think that Richard uh, can talk about this in more detail. Uh, but we see that Russia starts to develop a very limited interoperability with the Chinese armed forces. Uh, Russia has invited uh, PLA to the military drills uh, called Vostok, the, the East, in 2018, and that partnership will be enhanced. It's interesting because China was one of the primary targets of these drills before, and now PLA is taking part of it. So that also shows uh, a significant improvement in bilateral relationship. And uh, there were two incidents of joint uh, patrols of strategic bombers in 2019 and 2020. These are very limited and demonstrative uh, operations, but I think they point to a broader reality that Russia and China seek some limited interoperability uh, in the in the Pacific as well. I'll stop here. If any other panelists have response to the same question, feel free to add on. Otherwise, we'll move to the next question. Yeah, I would, I, I would say also that you see a lot of diplomatic coordination. So Russia and China have, have developed and pushed this joint peace plan for uh, South Korea. They, you've seen them become very critical of the U.S. alliances with Japan and South Korea. Um, they're particularly uh, critical of U.S. missile defenses based in these countries. Um, so you see, yeah, joint military exercises, a um, lot of diplomatic coordination, uh, and uh, what you're, you're not really seeing though is economic, uh, you know, joint economic efforts. So that's, that's the, the lagging indicator. Uh, I uh, heard in the question that uh, China uh, wants to limit the influence of the United States uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, not so, it's an incorrect uh, point of view. Uh, you know, uh, um, President Xi Jinping said that uh, the Pacific Ocean is uh, huge uh, enough to accommodate both China, the US, and other regional countries. Uh, we always uh, respect the existence, the historical existence and uh, uh, practical interests of the United States uh, here in the region, in the Asia Pacific. And uh, we have no intention to displace or replace the United States here uh, in the region. And uh, we are willing to uh, strengthen our communications and engagement uh, with the United States on the principles of uh, mutual trust and uh, equal footed uh, treatment towards uh, each other so as to manage the differences uh, and the contradictions uh, and uh, conduct uh, constructive uh, interactions. Uh, second point that I want to uh, make uh, is that uh, we are against uh, establishing uh, so-called small circles uh, against some specific countries in this region, in, in the Asia uh, Pacific. Uh, we think uh, all the regional mechanisms should be transparent, should be inclusive, uh, should be open. Uh, and uh, such uh, regional uh, mechanisms should aim at uh, strengthening mutual trust and cooperation uh, be between uh, countries uh, of the region uh, should benefit regional uh, peace, stability, uh, and prosperity, but not against any other uh, third party. As for the cooperation between China and uh, Russia in the region, I think the cooperation, the collaboration between the two countries uh, is aimed at maintaining uh, stability and uh, peace uh, and uh, um, yeah, develop, development and prosperity of the region uh, because both China and Russia uh, are located in the region. Uh, so uh, uh, how uh, the region uh, develops uh, going forward uh, has a direct impact uh, on both countries. Although Mr. Gabuyev said that, according to the civilizations, maybe Russia uh, doesn't belong to uh, Asia, it belongs to uh, Europe, but geopolitically, uh, it is located uh, in this region. So uh, it has 
uh, direct in interest uh, in the region. Uh, so uh, our uh, cooperation, uh, the uh, military uh, drills and so on and so forth, uh, they are aimed at uh, enhancing uh, cooperation uh, and uh, peace stability in the region, but not aimed uh, against uh, some uh, other specific countries. Thank you. Our panelists are finished with this question. I would like to move on to the next one. Um, our next question is from Jian Zhang Lu, um, and as, is as follows. Would it be possible in the foreseeable future that Russia would reorient to the US European bloc? For instance, Yeltsin was much closer to the West than Putin, and would such an attitude be likely to resurface? I think that the divisions between Russia and the West uh, really run very, very deep. Uh, it's uh, now the influence of the government's propaganda and the real displeasure of the large swath of population, including parts of the elite, uh, about the West. And definitely the list of grievances is very long and it continues to grow on both sides. Uh, and it takes a fundamental uh, rethinking of Russian's uh, foreign policy uh, foundations. I don't think a return to a, a kind of pro-Western or liberal uh, political orientation of the early 90s, uh, because Yeltsin has also two very different parts of his presidency and two very different attitudes towards the West. I think that the illusions about Russia's uh, opinion being considered has soured uh, and it's debatable whether the West should have cared about what Russia thinks about NATO expansion and other uh, issues at all back then. Uh, but definitely a late Yeltsin is very different from an early Yeltsin. I don't think that anybody in Russia has the illusion that Russia could be integrated into Euro-Atlantic Russians or that this really serves uh, Russia's national interests. At the same time, I think that the interest in having a normal, pragmatic neighborhood and not fighting over sovereign political choices of Ukraine and Belarus has a constituency in Russia, but that definitely will require a profound change uh, in Russia at home. Uh, I think that on the other side, uh, the change needs to be even more significant. Yeah, I think that as long as President Putin remains in power, this, that's impossible. I think he's so soured on, on the West and his, you know, his perceptions and views of the US and its allies are so negative. And in addition, his uh, policy in towards China is really described as the, the main success of his foreign policy. I think yeah, and that would, and so I just can't see him or anyone close to him repudiating that. Um, but you know, after he leaves office, other possibilities may arise. Our last question is from Alexander Schnorr. Um, his question is for the minister counselor. Um, Ms. Yang Fan mentioned that China supports the, the current global order, but that it needs some improvements. And he asked that you elaborate on this. What sorts of improvements does China seek and how does it seek to reshape the international order? Um, please repeat the question, sorry. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You mentioned that China supports the current global order but that it needs some improvements. And can you elaborate on this? What sorts of improvements does China seek and how does it seek to reshape the international order? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, in recent years, uh, there is a phenomenon uh, in the uh, international relations and the international uh, landscape that is a rise of the emerging markets. Uh, uh, I think uh, not only China, uh, India uh, are rising. Uh, are uh, becoming uh, stronger, but also uh, quite a few developing countries. Uh, but uh, the reality is that the representat uh, representativeness of the developing countries 
uh, of the emerging markets uh, in the international uh, institutions uh, is not so high. Uh, so uh, we think that uh, we need to uh, reform uh, the international institutions according to the uh, changes of the international uh, landscape. Uh, it is uh, not only reflected uh, in UN, but also it is uh, uh, specialized institu institutions uh, such as the uh, World Bank, uh, the uh, International uh, Monetary Fund, and so on and so forth. It's the uh, uh, first point. The second point is, is that um, the uh, society is progressing uh, ahead. There are many new technologies, uh, new uh, phenomena uh, in the world, uh, but uh, many uh, international institutions, uh, they, are, uh, they were established uh, in the 20th century uh, when uh, just the uh, Second World War uh, was concluded uh, in uh, 40 years, in 50 years, uh, and uh, uh, in 60 and 70 years. So uh, we should uh, reform, improve uh, such international institutions according to the changes uh, that are occurring uh, in the uh, 21st century. Uh, for instance, the reform of uh, WTO, the World Trade Organization, uh, there are so many topics uh, that are not included in the rules of uh, WTO. Uh, we uh, should, uh, ref uh, of course, uh, from one hand, uh, we should uphold the uh, multilateral uh, trading system uh, with WTO at its core. Uh, and from the other hand, we should reform it. Uh, according to the new realities, according to the development of the new technologies. Thank you. We actually have a bit of time. So if any panelists have a response to that same question or we also have another question. Okay, our next question is from Sophie Lasko. How does the Chinese government view Russian-Ukrainian conflicts in Crimea and the Donbass region? How does this impact Russian-Chinese partnership? The US has openly condemned Russian aggression in the Donbass. So how does China's approach to Russian endeavors in Ukraine play into China-US relations? It's a question to me. <laughs> For all of our panelists. <sighs> Let me start. Um, I, don't, I don't think that it's really that much important. I think that China tries to be diplomatic and always says that it supports the territorial integrity of Ukraine, but at the same time, it supports the peaceful resolution of the conflict along that lines. It doesn't really go into details because Ukraine is an important partner. Russia is an even more important partner. And then also China doesn't want to add more frictions to its already strained relationship with the West by choosing sides in this, uh, in this conflict. So I think that China is well aware of the facts of Russia's aggression, support and guidance for the rebels, but it really doesn't want to pick any sides here because China doesn't have that much stake in that conflict. Uh, along the same lines, Russia doesn't want to pick sides in the conflict between China and its neighbors in the South China Sea. So it goes like we supported national law, we support peaceful resolution of the territorial disputes, and we are against interference of the extra regional players, meaning the US. That's it. But Russia definitely doesn't provide any more tangible support for China's position. And I think that both countries are fine with that. China really doesn't need Russia's vocal support to exert its maritime claims in China and uh, in, in the South China Sea. And Russia doesn't need China's recognition of Crimea as part of Russian territory or support for its war in Donbass in order to continue with the, with the policies of its choosing. Yeah, I would, I would add that Russia has also been fairly tolerant about uh, Chinese investment in Ukraine. And you know, China used to get a lot of its, uh, it, when Russia was limiting its arms sales, China would bypass that by buying the systems from Ukraine um, and then, and 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 now you see the Chinese trying to buy, for example, uh, an important uh, motor uh, production facility to help help them develop advanced air aviation and air, you know, particularly fighter plane engines. So I think that 
yeah, China, Russia has been fairly tolerant about Beijing's policies towards Ukraine um, since it doesn't want to risk this most important relationship. He, Alex said that China's relations with others are so strained it, it wants good ties with Russia. I think it's even more so with Russia with its relations so strained with the West um, that it really can't, it doesn't, it just can't risk a two front confrontation with China at this point. Yes, uh, China uh, supports uh, sovereignty, uh, independence, and the territorial integrity of other countries. It's the principle that is written in the UN Charter. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, both Russia and uh, Ukraine are uh, friendly countries of China. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, Russia and uh, uh, Ukraine could resolve their uh, differences through dialogue and consultations uh, and uh, uh, with uh, peaceful uh, means. Uh, you know, uh, I have deeply believed that uh, Russia and uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, they are historically and culturally uh, very closely connected. I think they have the big wisdom uh, to resolve their uh, contradictions uh, through uh, engagements. Our next question is from Jason Fang. For all panelists, how do you see the shift of the potential development of the Sino-US quasi-alliance, given that the influence of the United States and East Asia is potentially decreasing? There are certain limits to this alignment. Uh, I don't think that both countries want to form uh, an alliance with the type of guarantee provided by Article 5, uh, because both countries have enough uh, strategic autonomy, and enough potential to pursue their independent foreign policy and defend themselves. So they don't need each other uh, for that sake. Uh, an alliance brings limitations to that freedom. An alliance also brings a question of hierarchy because we know that everybody in NATO is equal, but uh, some countries are more powerful and can uh, kind of kindly ask other countries to support its foreign policy goals while uh, newer members and smaller members probably cannot. They, they get defense, but they don't necessarily leverage uh, all of the assets available to the alliance to pursue their foreign policy goals. Uh, so I think that there are clear limitations, but as long as the U.S. is considered to be a challenge for both, and I think that uh, the U.S. shouldn't be written off uh, anywhere, particularly in the East Asia, because as uh, Jake Sullivan said uh, in Encourage, and it's true, uh, it's not only about the U.S. and China, but it's really about the U.S. and its allies. So the U.S. is not going anywhere. The alliance relationship are not going anywhere. And that means that both Russia and China have a lot of reasons to strengthen and deepen their cooperation, including in security realms. I believe we have time for maybe one more question. Um, this one is from Elliot Lan. Since institution building, like in the WTO, is a necessity in the short and medium term, how does an international set of actors come together to mutually make new rules in the realms of tech, climate change, or ongoing trade policy? How would this happen with the current global power dispensation? And does this make the need for new institutions because older ones have a lot more historical baggage and potential bias? There's a lot of dialogue. I mean, that you see in the UN, they just adopted some cyber rules and, and so on. But this is difficult because, the, you know, the, the, particularly in the arms control realm, you've got an arms control structure um, that its origin in, in Soviet US limits. Um, and now you have all these new technologies, cyber weapons, space weapons, artificial intelligence which clearly wouldn't, and you can't just do that between Russia and the US. And I think this is behind uh, the Trump administration push, which I expect the Biden administration push to continue to include China and other countries in some of these locations and transparency arrangements. Uh, Mr. Witt, uh, you uh, mentioned the so-called trilateral 
mechanism for arms control between uh, United States, Russia, and uh, China. Uh, you know, uh, China, according to its uh, um, arsenal, uh, nuclear arsenal, uh, is not on the same level uh, as the uh, Russian Federation and the United States. Uh, I think uh, uh, Russia and uh, the US, uh, they uh, shoulder the uh, most significant responsibility uh, for disarmament uh, and uh, for uh, maintaining the strategic stability uh, in the world. Uh, of course, uh, China uh, is uh, contributing uh, to the arms control regime as well uh, in the framework uh, of uh, five permanent members' uh, consultations in the framework of uh, Geneva Conference on Arms Control and through bilateral contacts. Uh, but uh, China will not be uh, a part for the so-called trilateral uh, mechanism for uh, disarmament because uh, China is not uh, at the same level uh, as a um, same level uh, has the same weight as uh, Russia and the United States. I think though the question was on the new technologies, and I think even that is something where China arguably could is is leading in some sectors, such as um, artificial intelligence, um, cyber capabilities. Um, it's developing a rapid, uh, rapidly developing its space program. And so if you're going to deal with these issues, I can't see how it's between, be between Russia and the United States. Even in the nuclear realm, um, it, I think that if you look at the, for example, missiles, China has more intermediate range missiles than Russia and the U.S. put together. And I think that's what contributed to the collapse of the uh, intermediate nuclear forces agreement. So I you know, I, I'd love to be able to just do the Russia-US for some of these because it's simpler, but it just it would, doesn't make any sense with proliferation of these capabilities to other countries. I believe we are just about out of time. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, Dr. Mitter had to leave us, unfortunately, a bit early. Dr. Gabweb, Dr. Weitz, and Minister Councillor Piao. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your insights and your vigorous discussion this morning. We truly appreciate you sharing your time and experience with us. Our Thank next you. panel is on turbulent tides, the South China Sea, and we'll begin at 10.30 a.m. EDT. We'd love for you to join us for that. Thanks. Thank you again to all of our panelists. Thanks, Rose.